everyone. I'm Jan Mercer Toms, the Vice President of U.S. Development with Joy Mayshad. We are an ecosystem of brands for women by women and connecting women to each other and to the companies, causes, and organizations that champion equity for women professionally and personally. You're here with us today watching Speak Your Mind with Dr. Risa Riger, brought to you each and every Monday. Please make sure to join our YouTube community at Joy Mayshad to stay up to date with all of our content and programming and check us out at our website, joinmeshad.com, where you too can learn more about how to become a member of our sisterhood, of how we engage, connect, and do business together, bringing so many unique opportunities to you each and every week. Dr. Risa Riger, welcome. How are you this week? Oh, Jan, what a week this is. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing okay. And, uh, we have the pleasure of having you today, and it's always it's always great. It's always great energy, and we really we really dig deep. We we go to hard places, and we you know we're willing to do that. And I'm so proud about that. Well, Risa, and this week is no exception to that because this week's theme is vote, vote, vote. To vote like your life depends upon it. And so here we are, a short few weeks away from our national election. And I like to think of some of our shows as time capsules, moments in time, where I wonder what it would be like in five or 10 years to reflect back on this episode that we're about to embark on together and actually relive this moment in time. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so, Risa, before we bring in our guest star for today, Let's have a conversation about what does it mean to vote and um, what does it mean in this this crazy new world, the year 2020, to think about politics and the political process and civic duty and responsibility, maybe through a different lens. Yeah. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, as we do every week, I'm going to talk about something that happened this week for me uh, that I want to share with you. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the backstory. It's, oh, I need a minute. <laughs> it's a hard one. Oh, Risa. But it's, it's important. It's important. So I decided to go yeah. with courage. And my, my mascara is going to run. Okay. All right. And then you'll know why. Okay. <sighs> Okay. So today, as I was thinking about what I was going to talk about, I decided that I had several choices to make. I had choices of some things that were easier and that would be helpful and it would be useful. But I decided to take really the harder route and talk about something that is hard to talk about. And so if I'm going to try to keep it together, but if I don't, I don't. So I'm going to have mascara coming down and we're in the sisterhood. And in the sisterhood, if you can't be real, if you can't be true, and if you can't be honest and be courageous, and if being courageous means that there's a couple of tears running down your face, so be it. But if we can't do it here, then we have to rethink that. So let me lead the way. So during, um, during my beginnings of my meditation over the weekend, I thought about the woman that I had met and had the honor of meeting. And one of the things that's been so important as we've seen in politics and, and we've seen is the importance of saying someone's name and the power of saying someone's name. And the name of the person that I want to say is Madame Jeanette Sosnowski. And Jeanette's a woman who I met in Paris. She was elderly at the time that I met her. She was, she was like the, a, a tank of a tiny little woman. And in her was such fire, such power. And Jeanette's story was just remarkable. And one of the ways that it was remarkable is because it was true. And this is a woman who went on to live a very ordinary life with an extraordinary story and extraordinary heart. So uh, Jeanette was in Paris, um, you know, at the outbreak of World War II. She was married. She had two sons. And as things went down the tubes in, in France and in Paris, 
um, she and her family decided that they needed to take action. Her youngest son, uh, Zizi Isidore, uh, they put in a convent more towards the south of France. Uh, Jeanette and her husband, um, they decided that they were going to contribute to the French underground. And their older son, Cadiz, also um, were involved in the French underground. So, and this was a Jewish family. Okay. So Jeanette was so committed and so sure of what she needed to do. She was so committed about how she was going to help and be most effective to help bringing democracy back to her country. And so she worked and there was not an issue because of her confidence, her, her integrity, her sureness of who she was at that time and who she has been. Uh, of course, she's no longer alive, that she worked as a prostitute for the French underground. And in that capacity, she was able to pull out vital information that helped that helped the French underground during this time of war. Uh, unfortunately, her husband was taken by the Nazis and he was murdered. And her older son, Hadis, was also murdered. And she was able, after the war, to bring her younger son back and to move on with her life in ways that were just extraordinary. And so what it, what is it that I want to say about this story? We could say, oh my gosh, what an amazing woman. We could say a lot about it. Um, but what we can also say, and where our call to action is here, and what I want to pull out and share with you is that here's someone who acted, who knew that there was something that she needed to do and found a way that she could she could work and be helpful, be useful, and 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 she sacrificed. And I think about her and the example that she set. And she's someone who's been dear to my heart from the first time I met her. And I think here we are now. And what is it that we need to do? What is what is our call to action? How can we help? We don't have to take the route that she took. We, do, we don't have to do that. But what we can do is we can vote. We can vote and we must vote. We need to vote. It is our obligation to vote. It's our responsibility to vote. It is our calling to vote. We had women, the suffragettes, fight hard and sacrifice in order for us to be able to vote. And so voting is not optional. The way you vote, you have a choice, but voting itself do not think of voting as optional. Find the way, and we're going to talk about that some more. So I have had my um, my moment, and thank you for, for sticking this out with me. Thank you for sharing, letting me share that with you. And I hope that hearing this story, hearing about this real person uh, will help you just put things in perspective. Things are hard now. We know that. Things are really hard. But nevertheless, we, we as adaptive, creative, inspired, and, and strong people need to find the way to vote. So Jan, after all of this, I'm going to like take it to you now. <laughs> Risa, wow. Thank you so much for sharing that story. There's I'm speechless. Like that's so impactful and powerful. I think for so many different reasons, I think that I love what you said at the beginning of, of your sharing, because it really resonates with the strength that ordinary people can have to move mountains. Right. And I think that there's a tendency in American culture sometimes to think that um, the mountain may be too big or the mountain doesn't impact me directly or it doesn't, um, you know, it might be something I need to worry about in the future, in the future, in the future, right? Well, the future is right now, folks. Like this truly is 
unlike any other moment in time in recent history where there is a lot at stake. And I'm wondering, Lisa, and I would even take what you said around voting one step further, and maybe the philosophy that we should incorporate into how we think about our daily lives now for the rest of the year and beyond is to say to ourselves, I'm going to vote and, and the end is up to us individually to be able to participate in civic civic activities, whether it's running for office at the city, local, state, federal level, or to embark on an, a, a community improvement project, or to advocate for those that have less than you do, right? There's always something more that we could be doing, even as we struggle with the day-to-day -day complexities of life right now. I think we all right now have enough toilet paper, we have enough water, we have enough hand sanitizer. <laughs> so now it's time to think what comes next. And we have a few short weeks before a very pivotal national election. And I think that there's, there's, we know that there's a lot at stake, but then I think that we don't know truly what's at stake this year. And that's what, again, no matter what side of the political fence you sit on, it's your responsibility to actually have your voice be heard and then take action beyond that too, right? And it's, and look like, and we'll, we'll speak with our guests very soon in the sense of the complexity of life right now. We all know that it's not easy. Um, but, you know, your story really drove home the point, Risa, of, you know, how much more challenging and difficult it could become and how fortunate we still really all are all of us that will be viewing this, this episode, honestly. Yes, and that there's, there's oftentimes, you know, people can think, well, you know, it's not so important that I vote, you know, or, um, you know, it's, it's hard, and, and that's true. So here are the two calls to action. Here are the two things. Right now, as you're listening, as you're hearing this, right now, if you haven't already, one, decide that you are voting. Even if you feel that you're not voting for yourself, you know, you're feeling like, oh, you know, I don't feel like it. It's hard, whatever. Find someone that you're voting for. If you're not voting on your own behalf, vote on behalf of someone else who's important to you, who is going to be impacted in, in this year, in next year, in 10 years, by one step following another. Find that person, find the, find the path for you to feel committed to vote. And take a moment right now, if it's not for you, then figure out who it's for, because someone, someone absolutely, like Jan and I are sitting here today, someone needs you to vote for them. So do it. That's one. Jan, are we okay on that? We're okay with number one. Yes, absolutely. Okay. okay. And number two is figure out your plan. Don't let November 3rd come and wonder how you're going to go about doing this. This is the time now to figure out your plan. If you do not know how to figure out your plan, talk to someone else. And we're going to give you information. Uh, call your board of elections. They'll help you. Contact the League of Women Voters. They'll help you. However it is that you need to vote, get your plan, figure it out. You don't have to work for the French underground. You do not have to sacrifice family members. But what you don't have to do that. What you do need to do is to vote, to exercise your right to vote, exercise the fact that there's some way that you're going to have access to do it. And that if even if you don't know how, that there are people that can help you. If you're religiously affiliated, contact, contact your church, your synagogue, your mosque, contact whoever you can contact. Get your plan together now. And so that when the time comes, you know what you're going to do. Jan, hop in. Risa, I want to piggyback on what you said around, you know, sometimes we think, well, my vote doesn't matter. I live in a blue state. So my vote doesn't really count because it's already going to go in one particular direction. And it has, you know, since the beginning of time. That could be true. But this year, it's incredibly important to vote. Number one. Number two, 
you know, Risa, last week we um, we hosted a tribute um, on your show to RGB, to Ruth. And we all know that um, that there's so much at stake in the sense of who takes her place. And so I think that this is also a time of deep reflection for how we all want to show up differently in the world going forward. Because for so many things that we honestly take for granted each and every day now as women, that could change, right? And so we really truly do need to dig, dig deep within ourselves and think about what do we want? What is the life we want to live for the rest of our lives for ourselves? But then Risa, to your, your incredibly impactful and powerful idea of voting on behalf of someone else, what is the future we want to create for them? Right. And so if we're choosing to vote for our children, we're choosing to vote for our grandchildren, we're choosing to vote for our community at large. What is the future that we want to create for them? And don't forget that the Supreme Court, because of the loss of RGB, like there is a lot of at stake there as well. Mm -hmm. In the in the meditative community, there's something called meta, which is kindness. And so uh, there's a particular kind of meditation that, you know, and, and meditation is not religiously affiliated that, you know, you wish, you wish kindness and happiness, for, you wish kindness for yourself, you wish kindness for your family. And then the idea also is that you have enough generosity in your heart that you can wish kindness for people that who don't, you, who you don't even know well. You could wish kindness on the person who does your, you know, who does the dry cleaning or the person who's delivering your packages uh, or your groceries and that you can send kindness out. And so this is the time where we tap into our, our internal largesse in a way that through one action, one action through voting. This is this really is the mandate for now. Is this one thing? I, I love what you're saying about now and later. It's like the candies, you know, now and later. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but that the fight for right now, get your now, get your now in order. No matter who you're voting for, get your now in order and and know your way. Thank you, Risa. Risa and I are thrilled to welcome Natalia Linos to our show today. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. You're so, so welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us on this very special episode. And, you know, we, this is um, Risa's incredible idea to bring the theme and the power behind getting out the vote to one of our conversations. And you ran for Congress in the state of Massachusetts. And so it's not only are you the executive director for the Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University, you also ran for Congress in the state of Maine. Talk to us about what that experience was like and what ultimately drove you to feel inspired to actually serve in that way. Well, it's great to be with you. And, you know, I'm not someone who has been in politics my whole career. I am an epidemiologist, so sadly, Everybody knows what that is right now, but a public health expert who looks at disease. And I decided to run because of the COVID tragedy. I felt that we didn't have enough public health experts in Washington and that the federal response was costing us lives. We had too many Americans dying, we still do. And so I decided to step in, in a way that I hadn't before. Um, and it was, an exciting time. It's an open seat. Actually, Joe Kennedy, uh, the third seat in Massachusetts, fourth. There were nine people running. I was the last to enter. Um, four women, five men, three moms. I'm one of the moms. And so it was an exciting time in politics. And people welcomed me. They said, you know, we don't have scientists and public health experts typically running, but this is the time to diversify the type of people who run and who can bring a different perspective. And while it was unsuccessful, it was definitely an amazing um, opportunity and uh, looking forward to sharing some of those insights with you. I just want to hop in for the moment because you said it was unsuccessful, but I would say that if you actually gave it a try, I mean, how many people can say that they ran for office, that they ran for Congress? And so to, to have the courage to go in to give it a try, to not know what the outcome is going to be, and to put yourself out there 
and to leave yourself open for the kinds of scrutiny and commentary, that that is an enormous place of success. So I I just needed to hop in and, and say that. Saying that, and I am tremendously proud of the team that we built. I mean, I jumped in in late April and I got about 400 volunteers. The leadership team was all women. It was women who had just, you know, two of them had just graduated from their MBA programs at Berkeley and their jobs had, because of COVID, been shifted, you know, six months down the line. And they said, you know, we really want to do something. Uh, there was a, a woman who just graduated from the Kennedy schools, uh, you know, the public policy school at Harvard. And, and so I got a group of women who were committed and excited and who had never run a political campaign before because I was entering so late. I checked with some of, you know, the people who knew how to do this. And they said, you know, you're entering late. Everybody who's good has been taken. Just figure it out. And it was such an amazing opportunity to bring committed women who were excited. We did have a few men too, but nobody in the leadership team um, to just, you know, do something different. And I think for them and for me, it was an experience that was important. And so, yes, I don't want to downplay that, but, you know, I didn't win, meaning I am not the nominee right now. You know, before the show, we were talking about, you know, some of the takeaways that you um, took away with you because of the experience of running for office. And, you know, Meshad brings together professional women for business development, relationship development, networking, as we like to think of it. Um, talk to us a bit about, um, you know, what that experience was like for you in the sense of, you know, how you tapped into your network and what were the major takeaways that you um, that you think we should know about? Yeah, I mean, the main thing is, is that politics is about your network. Um, running a campaign is expensive. So the network matters both for fundraising. And we see that a lot of women are not in Congress. Our Congress has about, you know, 25% women. We have very few mothers of young children. And I think those two, it says something about what you're able to do with your time, how you fundraise, you know, you're not part of an all boys club that can, you know, bankroll this campaign, you know, between us, some of the people who I was running against spent millions of dollars, two to $3 million. I only spent 400,000. And actually I think that the fact that I came in the top four, despite having spent a 10th of the money um, says something, but it also says something that I had only been able to raise a 10th of the money and networks matter in being able to raise money to being able to have, um, you know, to, to do what you need to do in a campaign. And that's important to raise right now because, you know, November 3rd is our election and whoever you're voting for, you should vote. But another thing to do is think about candidates who are not able to raise as much money. That's uh, women, it's people of color. And if you have the means to donate, that is a tremendous way to support the political process. And you know, as a scientist, I, it was very uncomfortable for me calling people and asking for donations. But I spoke, the more I spoke to people, they said, you know, that is how we participate in the political conversation. You know, I'm not running, I'm grateful that you are running and therefore I want to give you money, whether or not you win. It's not that I'm investing in you only if you win. I'm investing in a future that I believe in. So this is a call to people that there is a lot you can do as a voter, as a volunteer, and as a donor. And I encourage people who are listening to this to take that seriously and, and to try and engage in any of those three ways. What did you what did you learn? Because this is this is all new of voting during COVID. Yeah. And so what were some of the obstacles? What is it that you learned? What are some of the takeaways about how as as people who want to vote? How do we navigate this? What does that look like? So, you know, in most states um, now you are able to vote by mail. And for anybody who is worried about their health, and I think if you are in you know, any of the categories that are high risk, you know, voting by mail makes the most sense. Um, there is also early voting in many places. I'm not sure if it's in every state, which has allowed for voting to happen. So it's not on one day. You can do it in person, but over a stretch. In Massachusetts, it was over a week. So, you know, people could go in and vote. And instead of having a line, they would just walk in, vote and, and leave. And the precautions in Massachusetts, at least, were really good. You know, there was hand sanitizer, uh, lots of, you know, distancing, social distancing. You know, as a public health expert, I encourage people to vote by mail, but I know that people are worried about, you know, any irregularities. So for a lot of young people, they're saying, we're gonna vote in person. Now, if your state allows you to vote early in person, that would be one way to reduce the numbers. And I also wanna give a pitch here for anybody who is young and healthy to volunteer to be a poll worker. 
Traditionally, poll workers are older, retired, and they are at high risk of COVID. So for their health, many of them are not going to be at the polls um, on election day, which means that the lines might be longer and it might be more difficult. So if anybody who is listening is young and healthy and able to be a poll worker, I think that would be a great way to, to contribute to this election, whatever your beliefs are. That's a really, really, really good idea. Um, and we also, you know, we're almost in the month of October. Um, by the time that this show airs, we actually will be in October. Um, and so we have some important deadlines coming up that I think everyone should know about too, right? Like October 9th is the last day to register to vote in person. Um, are there other dates that we should also keep in mind leading up to the national election? Many of them depend on which state you're in. Um, so deadlines around, um, you know, the, the timelines for when you might have early voting or mail-in ballots. So you should look on your, uh, you know, election commission. You should, you know, encourage people to register. Ask your neighbors, ask your friends, um, because this election is a critical one. Um, and, you know, it's important for people to show up, to, to participate. So I don't have the dates in mind, but they are right around the corner. So don't wait. I want to reflect on something that you've said that I think is so powerful. Um, you said that COVID-19 is political, so scientists and science should be too. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of times we think of disease as just biology, you know, like something that happens to us that we can't control. But for people like me who are social epidemiologists, we know that disease is patterned. You know, it's not, if I don't think of you as an individual, but I think about our community, and I think about our country or our state, we know that people who have a lot of disadvantage are more likely to have poor health. And that disadvantage can be in terms of income, um, you know, structural racism plays out in ways that is really important. And we've seen um, different cities and different um, lo local authorities calling for racism to be recognized as a public health priority. We know that where you live, where you work, where you love, where you play shapes your opportunities for health. And we're talking about physical health and mental health. And COVID is no different. We have seen the rates of COVID be distributed unequally. You know, for black and brown indigenous communities, this has been a true tragedy. I saw a statistic that one in three black Americans personally knows someone who has died of COVID. The rate is one in 10 white Americans. That is unfair. And it shows that we have something you know, is going on. And the way that COVID is political is, you know, our, our labor laws, for example, not having access to paid sick leave means that some people are going to show up to work because they're scared of being, uh, losing their jobs and they'll be sick. Or it means that some of us have the privilege to work from home. And, you know, you were able to quickly transform your organization to a virtual one. But for people who work in low income, you know, jobs or they're delivering food, that isn't a privilege that they have. So we need to think about ways that our policies and our systems meet those needs just as much as they meet all of our needs. So COVID is political, health is political. And so scientists, you know, claiming that we are, we're just going to, in a vacuum, create a vaccine or in a vacuum, create a treatment without addressing these underlying factors um, is a problem. So we need to be more involved in politics. We talk a lot about identity at Mayshad, and um, you know, on your own site, you mentioned that you're an epidemiologist, a mother, a social justice advocate, and of course, you're an executive director at Harvard. Why do you think, for you, being able to claim the the complexity of that identity has been important for the work that you've done, even leading up to your decision to run for Congress, but then also what you do on a day to day basis at Harvard? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And the one identity that you didn't mention is that I'm Greek American. Um, my parents, I was uh, talking before, still live in Greece. And I spent most of my career at the UN. So I have a very global perspective in terms of, you know, I identify as a sort of a, a global citizen as well as an American citizen. And that changes the way I think about even COVID. You know, when we talk about a vaccine being available to Americans, I thinking about what about everywhere else in the world? You know, how are we going to make sure that we recognize the solidarity that is needed at the global level. So, you know, the multiple identities, you know, being a woman, being a mom of young kids, I have a seven-year-old and three-year-old twins, being a scientist, being at a, an institution like Harvard that is um, both an amazing, you know, opportunity, but also an institution that 
you know, running for office, I realized so many people across Massachusetts feel that Harvard has failed Massachusetts. You know, we we ask questions around health and human rights globally, but what about health and human rights around the corner uh, of our institution? So thinking a little bit more about the responsibility of an organization and, a, and an institution like Harvard to actually um, use that knowledge creation for the betterment of people. So my multiple identities, you know, people on the campaign trail asked about it, you know, but you're a mom, how are you going to do this? And I said, you know, the mom actually component is, it gives me a lot of insight. I'm an epidemiologist and a mom, so I'm concerned about school openings. Maybe Congress, if they had more epidemiologists and moms, they would be, you know, have figured this out earlier. Um, and all the parents across, you know, the country that I know of, that is top of mind, but yet that wasn't top of mind in Congress. So our identities bring um, a perspective that is unique. And I think that diversity is truly valuable in politics, at Harvard, and of course in business. So I had, a, I had a situation that really highlighted uh, what healthcare can look like. And I have a little dog, my first dog, um, Sammy. And one day, you know, just in the last month or so, Sammy had a seizure, which really, really frightened us. And so uh, Sammy was brought to the vet and then the vet, you know, ran tests. And then the vet suggested and recommended strongly that Sammy see a, uh, a veterinarian who is a specialist uh, in neurology. So Sammy, 12 pounds, 12 pounds of Sammy, got to see a, a neurologist and have a CT scan and had a full panel of blood work, was really worked up. It was decided that she, we really didn't need to have a spinal tap to do further testing on her, but it was something that was available. We also happened to have insurance for Sammy. And it just struck me how my dog has better health insurance than many, many people in the country. And that for many people in the country, they don't have access to the kinds of services that were available to my dog. Yeah, and that moment was, was just, you know, it's something that I knew, but it just brought it home in, in just bare relief. Yeah, it's it's truly a tragedy. And, you know, we often talk about the millions of Americans who are uninsured. But if you include the underinsured people who have insurance but have to, you know, their co-pays are too high for them to actually ever use their insurance, we're talking about 50 percent of American adults. I mean, that is absolutely um, a tragedy. And we are one of the wealthiest countries in the world. We have some of the best doctors, some of the best nurses, some of the best hospitals, and yet half of our adult population basically does not have access to that. And so it should not be surprising to us that we are the country that has the most COVID deaths. Right now, we have crossed the 1 million mark globally. 200,000 of those deaths are Americans. That's number one in the world right now. That is a huge number. And health insurance and access to health insurance is a big part of that. And our inequalities across the board and our disinvestment in public health is another big part of it. But you're absolutely right that if this tragedy is in a wake-up call for us to have that difficult conversation around health insurance, then what is? So I do hope that the, you know, our our politicians, you know, I, I had hoped to be one of them will be having these difficult conversations because the cost of inaction on our economy is higher than the cost of action. So let's talk about being like other countries where we have everybody have access to health insurance and, and health care. I want to talk a bit about also, and this is a really good segue into this, your, the platform that you ran on and the plan that you've identified. Um, I found it to be incredibly brilliant, and I'm sure that that would be really very helpful for all of us to hear about what had you envisioned in the sense of you know, re helping the United States of America rebound? Yeah. So, I mean, I had a very detailed COVID plan. A lot of people joked and they said, you know, a lot of my supporters were Warren supporters. And so they, they said, oh, your plan, you know. But it basically had COVID in, into three buckets. You know, we have the immediate crisis. And for that, we need the testing. We need the infrastructure for contact tracing. We need basically the, the public health response. But we need to be thinking about reopening and then recovering. And the reopening needs to be phased out. You know, for parents like myself, it is really, really difficult to get back to work if my kids are home. And I do worry about the gender inequities that will play out. I worry that more and more women will either go part-time 
or pull out of the workforce in order to be able to, um, you know, accommodate their caregiving, whether it's education or caring for older parents, et cetera. Then we have to think about recovery, the long-term recovery. And equity is a big piece. I talk a lot about, you know, an equitable recovery, but also aligning it with a green recovery. You know, climate change is something that our children are going to have to face for generations if we're unable to ensure that the money that goes into recovery from COVID is aligned with a green recovery. We'll be in trouble in five years, 10 years when the next climate related health emergency comes along. So let's not only focus on the immediate, but also have a plan for the long term. This three bucket approach is so important. And so that we don't leave anything out. It's like we have to respond, you know, we have to have a clarity about what we need to respond to now. You know, there's now and later and future. And that there's nothing that says that we can't integrate that. Yeah. And that that can't be part of how we how we think and what we do. And I think as women in particular, because of the kinds of plannings and what, what comes on our plates, that that's a natural way for us for us to think. And it's, you know, it's so important and, and so useful. Um, you know what? I would like to ask the question that is a different kind of question, um, which is that, you know, because I think you're just such a, an extraordinary resource for us, a, a resource guest to have today, that is there something that we haven't asked you that you would like to talk about? I mean, I think... You know, we have an opportunity between now and November to become political. I think a lot of people feel disillusioned by our political system, and especially people who are successful in business or successful in other parts of their lives. And, and we've allowed ourselves to sort of separate ourselves. But what COVID has made clear is that we cannot. We cannot step aside and ignore people who are not as, you know, well off because the risk that you know, we share risk. So schools are closing, our communities are shutting down unless we all step in. And so I hope that this conversation can lead some people to say, you know, I haven't voted in the last few years because you know, it hasn't served me well, but now I will step in to vote. Or I haven't really thought about the ways that um, science and politics interact, even though they're having these calls around, you know, listen to science, listen to scientists, what does that mean? And what can I do? And, and there is a lot that people can do. I think a challenge is that we become not only, um, you know, distance and pessimistic, that we turn inwards. You know, we shut down our doors. We create pods for our kids to learn. We, you know, stock up on food. But really, we need to be looking outwards because this crisis is here to stay for at least, you know, 18 months, maybe two years, maybe three years. There is going to be a new normal, and we need to not lose our humanity in this new normal. And part of it is, you know, civic engagement and political engagement and being there for our neighbors, but also thinking the big picture. So I'm really excited to be part of this conversation because I want people who don't usually talk to people like me to, to listen, you know, from me. And, and I hope to be part of future conversations. I do agree with you that women have a way of thinking, you know, big picture systems thinking. And we need to recognize that this is uh, really an important election. So let's not waste this next, you know, this opportunity to participate. Do you think that there's also such always an emphasis at the national level? And so, you know, the, which leads to then the feeling of being disconnected in the sense of what happens up here versus, you know, the reality of how most of us live down here, right? And, you know, as you've proven, there's so much opportunity for women at the state level, but even at the local level, I think that when you think about even school board participation, because there are incredible decisions that we don't always think that happen at the school board level that actually happen at the school board level, right? And other other ways to become more, more engaged and involved from thinking about civic participation, not just as civic participation, but like your, your, your duty, right? It's your duty as American citizens to become a part of the solution for what comes next. And look, like we all got ourselves here, right? Like whether or not we're impacted directly or indirectly by COVID, like in some ways, I think that many of us thought that we were going back to normal by now, but let's face it, normal wasn't really working for us even then, right? When we think about the environment and we think about human rights and we think about racial inequality in this country and access to healthcare and all of the, you know, the, 
very insanely important topics that you mentioned in our conversation. Um, so it wasn't really working before, right? So we have a, I honestly think that we have a responsibility to become more actively engaged at all different levels of government to really become a part of the solution and to really not just think to your point about politics as being something off here to the side, but really, you know, stepping into that voice in a different way to have it be infused in everything that we do. I fully agree with you. I fully agree with you that we can't go back to normal, that normal didn't work and that we have a voice. Like let's not, Think that we don't. And for those of you who don't want to get involved in politics, there's also different organizations in your neighborhoods. You know, you can do it through civil society or other, you know, groups. You don't even need to get political. But I do want to stress before we end that, you know, women need your help who are running for office, need your help. So if you can contribute either financially or getting the word out, that is going to get more women in office. And we as a country can benefit from that. So I would really, at every level, at the local level, at the state level, at the, you know, at every level. So, so do, do try and support some women candidates um, if you can. And I love what you're saying, Natalia, that there's a way for everyone to get involved. There's some path for everyone to do something that this isn't a time just to think. Thinking is important. It's also a time to do. And so we have to take from thought and transition into action, even if action is helping a neighbor who needs food, whatever that is, there's something that you can do. There's something that you can offer, provide that you have value to, to contribute. Exactly. And that's not to underestimate that women right now are being pulled in all directions as caregivers of kids, as caregivers of elderly. So I'm not, you know, I know I'm asking you to do one more thing, but this thing doesn't need to be a huge time commitment. It could be to make a couple of phone calls, show up to vote. And also your, if you have kids or other people in your community, bring them along. You know, my kids, I had a seven-year-old and three-year-old twins who were out with me campaigning, uh, you know, in parks and who were supporting me around the side. And they have learned so much. So it is a lot to ask of people right now. People are exhausted. Um, I am exhausted, but it's just a few months and then more long-term get involved in ways that make sense for you um, and that you can continue that commitment. This is such an inspiring conversation. So takeaways, Risa, take us away. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. Uh, first of all, uh, speaking of civil service, that Natalia came to join us today is really exactly what we've been talking about. Taking, taking your heart or taking your thoughts and putting it into action. And so today we must learn from that and use her as a wonderful example uh, that she came today as a, as, a, as a public service and as a service to us. And so one is to find a space of action for yourself. Find something that you can do because there's something that you can do. And don't say, if I can't do something big, then like, what's the point? The point is that Whatever it is that you do will have impact and it counts. The other is vote. Get it together. Figure it out. We're going to talk about this, you know, vote. You must vote. Get your plan together. Make it happen. Even if you're not, even if you feel your own vote isn't important, think about, are you voting for your daughter? Are you voting for your parent? Are you voting for your aunt? Are you voting for somebody else on the other side of the country? You must vote. This is an integral freedom that we have. It's part of our responsibility of being United States citizens. We're thrilled that you joined us today. I hope that you come and meet us again next week. And remember, as always, we've saved a seat for you. <laughs>